Um, thank you. No small task um, given to us, an assignment. Um, I want to thank Owsley and thank Mustafa and thank the Festival of Faith staff for bringing me home. It's always wonderful to be here, and um, it's a real honor to be on the stage with this company, so thank you. Um, the uh, journalism organization I founded, ORB, um, produces journalism that unites us as a global community around our human story. And I want to talk a little bit about the status quo in journalism, the idea of media and the public trust, and the opportunity presented by this great digital era. We all know that trust is gradually earned and quickly lost. Journalism's job is to tell us what's happening and why, especially when it's uncomfortable or inconvenient. By thinking critically and applying healthy skepticism to what we are told, to every source, and calling it as we see it without fear or favor. We can accomplish that job on the public's behalf. As journalists, we've lost the public's confidence because on the whole, we're barely doing our job. As members of the public, we now receive images, information, and opinions from around the world. And stitching what is often conflicting information together is incredibly overwhelming. I can only see why a parent working two jobs would give up on the media. And ironically, many journalism organizations have achieved a global reach, but still see themselves as serving a specific national or cultural audience. The idea that we can match our global reach by serving a global human audience hasn't really caught on yet. Journalism's still stuck in a very parochial mindset, and the result is a lot of us and them thinking, and from the public's perspective, the presentation of an incredibly fragmented, often conflicting image of our world, where there are lots of contradictions. In this context, it's easy to see how nationalism permeates our journalistic work and can be, even be used at its worst for a tool for dehumanization and war. Radio Mil Colleen's broadcasts during the Rwandan genocide are probably the most extreme example of media being used to dehumanize an entire community. Calling the Tutsis cockroaches, the radio called for their Hutu brothers to fill the graves with them. That is wildly blatant, but we do it in more subtle ways all the time. During the 2003 Iraq war, journalism allowed itself to be effectively co-opted. It became a powerful message machine of war, bringing the American public along on an endeavor I still can't explain or justify. Corporations, governments, and armies want to do things. They have an agenda that they're, they're working. To achieve that agenda, be it higher sales or the invasion of another country, they know people need to have a set of beliefs that will allow it. To build those beliefs in the public, they craft a message, and then they doggedly repeat it. Once a message is effectively planted in our minds, it becomes a belief, and we organize our thinking and behavior around it. It's journalism's job to see that mission, smile, and put the press release aside and find out what is really going on. <laughs> During the invasion and occupation of Iraq, journalism dramatically failed to do that. A great way to lose the confidence of the public as a journalist is to just repeat what you've been told and call it the facts. I was imprisoned by Saddam Hussein's security services in Abu Ghraib in 2003 during the invasion. It was a harrowing time for me personally, um, and I did think I would die there. Um, it's a story in and of itself, and it's one that I'm happy to have, but for another conversation. I wasn't tortured by Saddam Hussein's guards, even though there was a rich history of that at Abu Ghraib. So there's a personal and, frankly, quite uncomfortable irony for me when I learned about the torture that was happening in the prison after the American military took over. I worked with an amazing translator in Iraq for almost 14 months, and part of her job was to tell me about what people were talking about on the streets, regardless of what I was assigned to work on and what I had given myself to work on. In October of 2003, she told me about the stories she was hearing about how badly people were being abused at Abu Ghraib. I was a little incredulous that Americans would torture prisoners. It isn't, it's against our values, I remember telling her. We would never do that. 
and I dismissed an idea that was really uncomfortable to me. In December 2003, I was interviewing a source for our film, Meeting Resistance, and he talked at length for like an hour and in detail about how people who were arrested were being tortured. He talked about the use of dogs, electrified, electrified cages, humiliation, all the things that came to light. And this was four months before the story broke. And yet, like a lot of my peers, I missed the story. All I would have to go, had to, all I would have to have done was go and stand outside the gates of Abu Ghraib prison with the thousands of family members of prisoners inside and listen. They would have hundreds of times corroborated a story of torture. But to do that, I would have had to have believed it was possible that the US would torture people. And I now know how naive I was, but I didn't believe that we would do it. We know 60 Minutes sat on the Abu Ghraib torture story at the request of the Pentagon, only airing it when Cy Hirsch was going to publication in The New Yorker with images, or proof, as we like to say. When the story broke and the pictures were everywhere, my translator came to me, a curious and screwed up expression on her face. I had to look at her, tears in my eyes, and apologize for how wrong I was apologize for the behavior of my country. It was an important lesson that I'll never forget, that we need to be willing to listen and be open to challenging our own beliefs as journalists, or we aren't doing our job. Call it marketing or messaging, psychological operations, or whatever you like, but controlling the message of any event or issue is deeply shapes the framework within which the public will think about it. The White House and the Pentagon did a brilliant job of shaping the message and controlling that framework around the Iraq war, war and invasion. Two specific things had a dramatic impact. The embedding process during the invasion, and secondly, the message that they crafted about who was attacking coalition troops after Baghdad fell. In the embedding process, journalists rode in the convoys, tanks, and armored personnel carriers with US soldiers as they invaded Iraq and took Baghdad. You bond and develop empathy with anyone that you suffer with, and it worked. US soldiers were humanized and shown as heroes. The enemy was dehumanized, faceless, violent, evil even. The effect was that the US public was brought on board with the killing of people, soldiers and innocents, because they were only shown human beings on our side in a complex situation. As the invasion turned to war and things got messy, the language used from the podium in Washington and Baghdad to describe those who attacked coalition forces was smart and effective. Dead-enders, bathy diehards, common criminals, religious extremists, foreign fighters. The implication is that these are fringe elements of a society, that they don't represent any real or valid public sentiment. And because they're fringy, they can be identified, separated from the public, killed, and peace can be delivered. It is a lovely narrative, one I wish were true. And if I hadn't spent 10 months interviewing people who were involved in attacking coalition forces, I might have believed it too. I certainly would like to. The reality was a grassroots indigenous resistance to occupation that evolved quickly over the summer of 2003, making anything the US hoped to achieve in Iraq impossible. If you think I'm dreaming, or still naive, or suffering from some sort of Stockholm syndrome, go read the 2003 National Intelligence Estimate that was leaked in 2006. It deeply contradicted the White House and Pentagon's public message and implied an unwinnable war, certainly an inconvenient, inconvenient reality at that time. The media carried that clever messaging for a solid two years before it ever even questioned it, and then it was a limp interrogation. The US public is still confused by why we invaded Iraq, why we're still there, and why the Iraqis can't get themselves together. So those are examples of how journalism's parochial or national lens affects the public, both the American public and, frankly, the global public. At the beginning, I mentioned the opportunity uh, presented by the digital era. We can now reach a global audience instantly, and I believe we can upgrade journalism's role to meet its amazing global reach. The opportunity takes two forms. 
the business opportunity is to develop a large and diverse global audience that pays a small annual membership to support its work. This delivers a grassroots supported and most importantly, financially independent business model for journalism. The civic opportunity, which for me is much more important, is to tell one story to that diverse audience, uniting us as a global community around our human story. The greatest challenges and opportunities that we face are transnational in nature. We must collaborate across our national and cultural differences to successfully manage them. And in order to collaborate, we must see ourselves as part of one interconnected human community, recognizing our shared interests. For all our differences as human beings, we share a core that profoundly outweighs them. At the end of the day, journalism is simply stories that help us understand our world. At Orb, we're using these stories to draw a picture of us as a global community of human beings. My personal hope is that by seeing ourselves as one, we may find ourselves on a path towards a more peaceful future. Most journalism happens like this. An event occurs and journalism responds by covering that event as it evolves, drop by drop. Alain de Baton described the experience of journalism as reading the great novel Anna Karenina, but in a series of 500 word installments. <laughs> the point, context, purpose, big picture of the narrative work is easily and quickly lost. Journalism is suffering from this, but frankly, so are we. In order to perceive the world as a whole and tell stories that feel relevant and resonate with a global, diverse audience, Orb has redesigned the editorial process. We've turned the classic reactive drop, drop, drop journalism process on its head. We diversify our naturally limited experience of the world by calling on the new tools of the digital era. We use data, uh, which can embody and hold lots of understanding, but scattered like little drops across various silos of learning. And Orb is bringing those drops together into a cup of information that we can drink from. So we can see the world holistically and see what trends are evolving and how the world is changing. It delivers us understanding, it delivers us insights, and frankly, it challenges our, our assumptions about how we see the world. We can also engage the public. There's a lot of knowledge and experience out there in the public. That would be you. Um, and on any given issue, Orb will um, tap into that knowledge by using social media and digital tools so that we can have access to that wisdom. And we put professional journalists in the field, teams, who travel, teams of two who travel to multiple countries doing actual reporting, checking what we've learned through the data analysis and the public engagement. And their job is to distill what is often complex and contradictory information into the only thing that we as human beings have ever really been able to remember, learn from, or share a compelling story. In order to tell one story to a large, diverse audience, or bears the burdens of making our single stor daily story accessible. We tell stories about issues that we all have in common, so food, water, energy, health, education, environment, trade, and governance. And we publish each story in three versions, a text version, an audio-only version, and a multimedia version to meet your consumption habits. And we publish in the 10 most widely spoken languages. We have a tone that is curious and learning, and we publish in a design that's used for those mobile devices for when we spell send spend time in the cell phone region of our life. Um, we do all this work for a very simple reason. We believe in individual agency. Every morning, each of us gets up and makes a series of decisions about what we will buy, how we will vote, what kind of work we will do, how we will do it, what we will tell our children about the world we live in and their role in it. Individual knowledge shapes individual action. Our future isn't shaped by CEOs and presidents, but by the individual actions of the billions of people on this planet. We are living through the greatest transfer of power in history. Power is now defined by being able to make sense of the deluge of available information. Orb recognizes this and respects the public, placing an accurate picture of the world that we share in their hands. We live on a planet with a growing population, boundaried resources, and a habit of violence when things get tight. The path we're on today leads us to a conflict-ridden future. I've seen conflict up close. I've seen societies shredded and innocent lives demolished and I believe that it's worth every effort to avoid. Journalism can unite us meaningfully by focusing on our common interests, 
telling stories in a way that builds compassion, empathy, and understanding across cultures. And that is what we seek to achieve. I'm going to invite you, I'm going to skip through these next slides, which are um, some examples of our work. I hope you'll go to our website and look at how we tell our stories a little differently. But come visit us at orbmedia.org and sign up to join us on our journey to unite the global community around our human story. And thank you. <laughs>